Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we discussed the talocurl joint. Now remember that the talocurl joint is really a joint between the talus, this bone right here, inferiorly, and then sitting on top of that is really the ankle mortis. And the ankle mortis is really just composed of the distal part of the fibula and the tibia. And we can really get an appreciation for this talocurl joint by looking at this anterior view of the right ankle. So over here, this much larger bone that's more medial, this is going to be the tibia. Here's its medial malleolus. And then here's the fibula, much smaller, more lateral bone. And if we look, the tibia and the fibula really form this concavity right here called the ankle mortis. Okay. So the ankle mortis is really composed of three things. Okay. It's composed of the medial border of the distal fibula. Uh, some might actually say the medial border of the lateral malleolus, but again, it's the medial border of the distal fibula. We have the lateral border of the medial malleolus right here, and then just the inferior portion of the tibia, which really forms the roof of the ankle mortis. Okay. And then beneath that right here, we have the talus. Okay, so this is the talocurl joint. Now we can see the subtalar joint, which is the topic of this video, here in the right image. So this right here, now we're going to begin talking about the subtalar joint. And then remember that the talocurl joint really allows two movements, and those are plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. If you want more information on that, go back to the previous video. Now, when we talk about the ankle joint, normally most people are thinking of the talocurl joint, but the ankle joint is really just a broad term, and it really encompasses both the talocurl joint right here, and also the topic of this video, the subtalar joint. So let's take a look now at this view of the ankle. So right here in my mouse is tracing, this is the talocurl joint. Remember, it's a joint between the ankle mortis and the talus beneath it. But if we go to the subtalar joint, that's a joint between the talus superiorly and the calcaneus inferiorly. So this large bone that really juts out more posteriorly right here, it's beneath the talus, this is your calcaneus. And the bone that sits on top of that is the talus. So this joint right here that I'm tracing out, this is the subtalar joint. It's subtalar because it's beneath the talus. And so we're going to be talking extensively about the subtalar joint here and the ligaments that stabilize it. So first of all, the subtalar joint, as we've already mentioned, is an articulation. It's a joint between the talus superiorly and the calcaneus inferiorly. The subtalar joint is a functional synovial joint. And it's going to allow a different set of movements than the talocurl joint. Remember, the talocurl joint facilitates plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. The subtalar joint is a lot more complicated. Okay, so we can think about it in terms of composite movements or complex movements and simple movements. The composite movements we're going to explore more in the next video, and those are going to be pronation, supination. And when I say composite movements or complex movements, they're complex because pronation and supination are actually uh, made up of multiple movements that all occur at the same time. Okay, So depending on the list that you're looking at, you can see three or four movements that are all part of pronation, or three or four movements that are all part of supination. Whereas here in this video, we're really just going to explore the simple movements of the subtalar joint. Okay, so if you want the more composite movements, go to the next video. The two simple movements allowed by the subtalar joint are eversion and inversion. Okay, so let's talk about these. So when we're talking about eversion and inversion, we have to imagine, or you can even look at it, the plantar surface of your foot. So that's, of course, the bottom of your foot. That's the part that you walk on, the plantar surface. And if you're going to evert, you're going to angle the plantar surface away from the midline. You're going to angle it laterally. So by definition, subtalar eversion is where the plantar surface of the foot moves away from the midline, or it's angled more laterally. And you can see that in this short clip right here. Whereas inversion of the subtalar joint 
is where the plantar surface moves toward the midline. So you're pointing the bottom of your foot toward the midline. And generally speaking, uh, we consider these two movements to occur in the frontal or coronal plane. Okay, whereas generally, although it's a little more complicated, these talocrural movements of plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, those are going to occur more in the sagittal plane. Subtalar movements are going to be pretty much in the coronal or frontal plane. All right. Now, between these two movements, eversion is more limited in its range of motion. You can see that on average, the range of motion for eversion is only about 10 degrees. And one of the reasons that the, the range of motion is so limited is because eversion is limited by a set of very strong ligaments uh, that actually lie on the medial aspect of the subtalar joint, really at the ankle. And those are the deltoid ligaments, sometimes called the MCLs of the ankle. We'll actually be discussing those on one of the next slides. Inversion has approximately double the range of motion of eversion. So for these purposes, we'll say inversion on average is about 20 degrees range of motion. And the range of motion is a little bit more for inversion, uh, partly because of the bony architecture, but mainly because that inversion is limited by weaker ligaments. And those are called the LCLs or the lateral collateral ligaments. And those are actually going to be course on the lateral side of the ankle of the subtalar joint. Okay, If we're looking at muscles that facilitate eversion, we're mainly looking at muscles that are going to go along the lateral side of the leg and across the ankle, and those are going to be fibularis longus and fibularis brevis, also called peroneus longus and peroneus brevis. If we then think about the muscles that facilitate subtalar inversion, we're mainly thinking about tibialis posterior, although it should be known Tibialis anterior also facilitates inversion. We mentioned in the previous video that tibialis anterior mainly is going to facilitate dorsiflexion. However, if you really contract uh, the tibialis anterior, you're going to get dorsiflexion and subtalar inversion. So tibialis posterior and anterior. Okay. So now let's go into more detail and take a look at some of these ligaments right here that stabilize the subtalar joint. And the first set we're going to look at are the MCL ligaments, and these collectively are called the deltoid ligament. Now, the deltoid ligament is made up of four individual ligaments. Okay? Those are posterior tibiotalar, tibiocalcaneal, tibionavicular, and anterior tibiotalar. Now, there's a couple nice things about these, okay? and this actually goes uh, the same rules for the LCLs, is that, first of all, the name tells you which set of ligaments they belong to. Okay? Let's think about the bones for a second in the lower leg, okay? tibia and fibula. Which one of those is the medial bone? Well, the medial bone is the tibia. The fibula is lateral. So if we are looking at LCLs, so those are going to be the ligaments that are on the lateral side, they're all going to bear the name fibula or some form of that in their name. If we're looking at the MCLs on the medial side, also called the deltoid ligament, they're all going to bear tibia or some form of that in their name. So take a look at this. These are our medial ligaments, MCLs, deltoid ligament. They all have tibio or something like that in their name. So that tells you these ligaments, if you see this in a multiple choice, these belong to the deltoid ligament, which is part of the MCL. The other nice thing is that the name actually tells you what two bones they connect. So let's take a look at those. So this one back here, more posteriorly, this is the posterior tibiotalar ligament. It connects the posterior part, really, of the medial malleolus of the tibia, right here, to a portion of the talus. It's tibiotalar. Going a little bit more anteriorly, this one is the tibiocalcaneal ligament. It's really connecting this more uh, middle inferior part of the medial malleolus of the tibia down to a portion of the calcaneus right here. So it's tibiocalcaneal. And if we really want to get specific, this part of the calcaneus that sort of juts off and looks sort of like a shelf here for this ligament is called the sustentaculum tali. Okay, but that's part of the calcaneus, so tibiocalcaneal. The next one going a little bit more anteriorly right here, this is the tibionavicular ligament. Now, the origin of this is actually covered up by the tibiocalcaneal ligament, but it would be somewhere here on the tibia. It kind of will run up here to the tibia, and it actually runs out here to the navicular. Remember, we have the cuboid, which is more lateral. 
we have the cuneiforms, which are medial and distal, and the, the navicular, which is medial and proximal. Okay, so there's navicular. So this is on the medial aspect. And this bone right here would therefore be navicular. Okay, and you can see it going from the tibia down to the navicular. So tibio-navicular ligament. And then this one right here, which is the most anterior, this is the anterior tibio-talar ligament. Again, we can see right here it going from really the anterior portion of the medial malleolus of the tibia down to this bone right here, which actually is part of the talus. So anterior tibio-talar. Now the reason these ligaments are also called the deltoid ligament is because if you look at their approximate shape, just kind of trace out their shape, more or less, I guess you could make an argument that they kind of form a triangle. And the Greek letter delta is a triangle. So that's why they're called the deltoid ligament. Okay, now these ligaments are on the medial side of the subtalar joint, really of the ankle, but really the medial side of the subtalar joint. So which motion are they gonna protect against? Well, these are gonna protect against eversion. If you look down at your ankle, and you actually take it into subtalar eversion, notice that the medial side of your ankle is stretched. So because these ligaments are on the medial side of the ankle, they are going to protect against and limit eversion. And also remember, because these ligaments overall are stronger than the LCLs, that means we're gonna be restricted in eversion more than inversion. Eversion, remember, only had about 10 degrees range of motion, whereas inversion was approximately double that. And again, depending on which source you're looking at, you'll see variation. But at the very least, no eversion is much more limited than inversion. Now let's take a look at the LCLs. There's only three of these. And again, a couple nice things. One, these ligaments are all on the lateral side of the ankle, really of the subtalar joint. And so notice they're all going to bear the word fibula in them in some form or fashion. And also, just like the deltoid ligaments, these also tell you the two bones that they connect. So, for example, let's look at the first one. This one is posterior talofibular ligament. Okay? So you can see here it's connecting the fibula. Really, it's on that uh, lateral malleolus and connecting it to uh, the posterior aspect of the talus right here. Then we have the calcaneofibular ligament. This one right here you can see is actually connecting the most inferior part of that lateral malleolus, ultimately down to the calcaneus. So this is the calcaneofibular ligament. And then the last one is the anterior talofibular ligament. That one is right here. It's going much more uh, horizontally. This one is also connecting that lateral malleolus, really its inferior anterior portion, to uh, the anterior part of the talus right here. Now these ligaments, the LCLs, being on the lateral aspect of the subtalar joint, these are going to limit inversion. Okay? Remember, inversion of the subtalar joint is where the plantar surface moves toward the midline. So if you go and look at your foot and go into subtalar inversion, you'll notice the lateral side is what's stretched. Okay? And so because these are on the lateral side, these limit inversion. Now the fact that the LCLs are weaker than the deltoid ligaments leads to an important consequence clinically, and that's that inversion ankle sprains are much more common. Um, about 85 to 90% of ankle sprains are an inversion ankle sprain. Only about 10% of them are gonna be eversion ankle sprains. So eversion ankle sprains are much more rare, and they usually take a significant force to rupture anything, and oftentimes eversion ankle sprains are also associated with fracture of certain components here, such as the talus and even the fibula, okay? Uh, but inversion ankle sprains are much more common. And there's a lot more criteria to this, um, such as weight-bearing ability and the degree of, of effusion in the joint, but generally speaking, if we're looking at a grade one inversion ankle sprain, a grade one is normally going to really just rupture the anterior tibiofibular ligament, or ATFL. Okay, so that would be a grade one. If we have a grade two, we're gonna get a rupture of the calcaneofibular ligament as well, the CFL, as it's often called. So grade two, you would have both the CFL ruptured and the ATFL, anterior talofibular ligament. A grade three inversion ankle sprain is going to also include this one, which is the posterior talofibular ligament, or the PTFL. Okay, so 
when you're looking at grading an ankle sprain, yes, there's a lot more criteria to that, but anatomically speaking, generally grade one is going to be just the ATFL, grade two is going to be ATFL plus CFL, and then grade three is going to be all three of them. Okay, um, And this is mainly because out of these three, ATFL is the weakest, CFL is kind of in the middle, intermediate, and PTFL is the strongest of these three. However, collectively, they're all still weaker than the deltoid ligament. Okay, A couple other things to notice here that are important is if you look at uh, the calcaneofibular ligament, notice that it actually goes underneath the tendons of fibularis longus and brevis. Okay, so for example, this one right here on top is fibularis brevis. You can actually tell that because it's inserting on the base of the fifth metatarsal, whereas fibularis longus actually traverses under brevis and it actually goes under the plantar surface of the foot to insert really more on the uh, first metatarsal. Okay, but notice that both of those go over the CFL over the calcaneofibular ligament. If they're going under something, these are likely the retinacula. So this is the superior fibular retinaculum, and this is the inferior fibular retinaculum. So those tendons go under the retinaculum, but they actually go over the CFL. And so if you're looking at a cadaver, that can be a good way to differentiate the retinaculum from this ligament. Okay. Also notice that the CFL is between the two portions of the fibular retinacula. Okay. And another thing, if we're also looking at the posterior talofibular ligament, um, it's not shown here because the tendons have been cut, but these tendons also go over uh, the PTFL. Okay? Uh, the PTFL is underneath the tendons of these two muscles. So hopefully after this video you understand better about the movements of the subtalar joint and also the ligaments that stabilize those movements. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.